So what or who is not wanted in the backyard? No one in their right mind wants crime in their backyard. No one wants drug dealing or that those activities and those offshoots and the consequence of active substance use disorders and alcoholism, um, no one wants those, those consequences in their backyard. But, you know, what drives the dealing in the crime? Addiction, untreated addiction, untreated alcoholism, drugs of misuse, substance use disorders are those drivers. And just a brief description, in some human beings, substance use disorders create such a powerful experience that, in, that the individual's mind becomes obsessed with remaining in an altered state caused by that substance, whether that substance be wet or dry. I think that about, Todd, would you agree that covers all of them for the most part, wet, dry? Okay. <laughs> Substance use disorders, um, the alcohol use disorder confers a prodigious burden of disease, disability, premature mortality, high economic costs from lost productivity, accidents, violence, incarceration, and increased healthcare utilizations. One of, one of my previous vocations was I was a electronic technician, a senior technical specialist, and I did quality control work on medical diagnostic instruments. That company spent a lot of money training me. And because of that, when my substance use disorder began to make all my decisions for me, and I had those brief periods, they gave me a chance after chance after chance because of the investment that they made in my education and my training. But at some point, they had to cut me loose. And um, so... And that's just, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, know, I know that I'm, you know, preaching to the choir here, but, um, you know, really that condition of the mind is what we want to talk about here. Um, so raise your hand if you have seen Ken Burns' special on Prohibition. Okay. I highly, if you have not, I highly recommend Ken does a masterful job of documenting alcoholism and unfortunately the, I'll say the bad, the bad past decisions that we as a society, as America has made in an effort to curb alcoholism. And guys, I'm telling you, we're pretty much making the same mistakes all over again. Um, I, I think you guys would agree that um, prohibition was a bad idea. I mean, I'm from Chicago. If I say Chicago, y'all think what? Right. <laughs> you know, and um, but one of the things that in talking about 1830, if you think about a lot of the major cities were being developed around water. And as the cities grew, what began to happen is less access to fresh water. And so the doctors at that time, what did the doc say? drank alcohol. By 1830, the average American over 15 years old consumed nearly seven gallons of pure alcohol a year, three times as much as we drink today. And alcohol abuse, primarily by men, was wreaking havoc on the lives of many, particularly in an age when women had few legal rights and were utterly dependent upon their husbands for sustenance and support. Guys, focus on that that phrase, wreaking havoc. Wreaking havoc on the lives of many. The havoc is a symptom of a substance use disorder. The media sensationalizes and stigmatizes a symptom. Politicians have used the symptom as a political cudgel to present themselves as tough on crime. Laws have been created to treat a symptom. With the creation of laws, the symptoms of addiction have been criminalized. With criminalization, a human being with a substance use disorder is marginalized as a criminal. Jails, prisons, and other institutions have been misused and expanded to treat a symptom of a condition they were never equipped to handle. 
Not in my backyard is an attempt to keep the symptoms of substance use disorders out of the community. The fear that this residence, organization, and the people seeking recovery services will negatively affect the quality of the neighborhood and its homes and its families. Um, you know, I could keep on rolling, you know, whether it be the, again, the wet or dry, the, you know, drugs, you know, drug related impairment is persistently stigmatized, delaying preventing treatment engagement, substance use disorders, and opiate use disorders in particular are among the most stigmatized conditions in psychiatry and indeed throughout societies. More generally, such stigma leads to the fears of discrimination and negative repercussions that prevent or delay sufferers from seeking treatment, leading to greater morbidity and mortality risk. So I might be kind of slick here, but I'm pretty sure everyone in the room has heard that silly phrase that treatment is for quitters. I mean, well, there's a, I mean, there's a stigmatizing statement for you, you know, um, the, the level of, again, marginalization and othering and, and keeping people separate and, you know, in rural communities, You know, it's a it's a different challenge. I mean, they're tight knit. They are. You're you're not from here. What are you you doing? And then you know, some codes and some structure, and that is what that that society is made of. And you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and then. You know, in some instances, not all, and it's and it really has begun to change because of what OUDs have done to our society. But I'm sure everyone has, you know, working in this field, whether and it may even happen to you if you're in in long term recovery. Um, you know, you, someone shows up back at their house and they look on the porch and there's a garbage bag sitting out on the porch. You know, you're not welcome here anymore. Um, you know, the instances, you know, working with the guys at the center, you know, asking them a simple question. Um, when you went to your mom, your sisters, your aunts, or your grandmother's house, how many times a day when you were in your active substance use disorder? Now, this is a protective thing, but what was the first thing they did? They hide their purse. And, you know, if we can approach this thing in a little more meaningful way, a little kinder, a little more understanding, a little more acceptance, and move away from the, the condemning and shaming and guilting that so, much is, that so much of our society has done with those of us who have a, a substance use disorder. Let's see. Uh oh. What did I do now? I broke it. Did Scott break it? Yeah, Scott broke it. Scott broke it. Yep, yeah, there we go. No section of our society has been able to isolate itself from devastating effects and consequences of addiction and alcoholism. No amount of money, power, societal prestige, societal prestige can insulate a community from it. Have it can, can anybody think of a situation where, or a society, a community has been able to insulate itself? Um, net, August, I will turn 60 years old. Thank you. We're not there yet, but thank you. My father was a police officer in the Evanston Police Department in Evanston, Illinois, for 33 years. He retired as a lieutenant. And he, he, did he bring the movie Scared Straight Home and made all of us watch it? Yes. But the other thing he was also, too, was um, he was officer friendly, and he would go around to the, the high school in a different junior high schools in our city, um, 
and and grade schools and do truck do talks on drugs and it would just simply say these are the this is what the effect will be if you ingest the substance trying to scare the heck out out of everybody yes but so you know growing up in that environment and and then later on as i mentioned earlier um my father also found his way to recovery that changed the dynamic in our house that changed the dynamic with our family that changed the dynamic with the society and our neighbors and you know you know one person's recovery changed the dynamic of our entire family now i had all this other stuff kind of rolling around in my house but you know thank god for that recovery capital that 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 my father was able to demonstrate why can't we provide that same opportunity for our communities why can't we have these same situations quality well run guidelines and process driven responsible houses environments where people can find their recovery i think we can do it recovery oriented words are important if you want to care for something you call it a flower if you want to kill something you call it a weed Don Coyas, president and founder of White Bison Incorporated. Love that man. Got to meet him once. What is recovery housing? Recovery ho recovery is a process that doesn't happen overnight. All quality processes require time. Many people have completed short-term treatment or have received substance use services as a justice-involved individual due to a SUD-related issue. In many instances, these persons do not have the personal resources to afford a safe, reliable place to reside while seeking long-term recovery. Is that, I don't think that's too much for us, a service to, to provide, an environment to provide. Providing humans with a structured, consistent, recovery-first, low environment, while the resident seeks recovery services and participates in a mutual aid fellowship, tailored to lead the residents to long-term recovery, redirect from the havoc created from an active substance use disorder to a life free of substances. Let's see here. Creating and maintaining an open, safe, inclusive setting, reflecting worth, promoting connection, and belonging are essential elements of a peer-led, peer-driven social model recovery homes. Recovery is a reality and enhanced and in the right, enhanced in the right environment, and recovery housing is that environment. So, so one of the privileges that I get to do is I get to do trainings on the peer-led, peer-driven social model of recovery. And one of the presentations is simply this. As a house, you state along similar lines of what I just read, you know, what your purpose is and the principles, okay? This is the environment that this is what this home is. And so when you have participants or residents, potential residents come to you, say, hey, you know, this is an alcohol and free drug environment. Do you accept that as being a, a willing participant in this house? This is your responsibility. Where are we putting the responsibility now? Is that, a, is that an authoritarian, a tell, a demanding presentation? Or is this, do you accept? You want to, we want to put that right in the lap of the individuals. And the same thing all the way down through, if you want to say the, the cardinals, you know, that this is an, a violent, a, a, an environment free of violent threats of violence and bullying. Do you accept not to participate in those things? An environment free of slurs or innuendo free of sexual conduct. All we're asking is you not do it under this roof. Come on, y'all, that was kind of funny. Okay, maybe not. All right, we'll keep on rolling. Free of stealing and free of gambling. In this environment, this is, these are just some of the major principles that as a resident here, do you accept their responsibility? Yes. 
Well, like, since we're talking about uh, Lindy, um, looking at the first one, I think we all agree that for everybody's protection, it has to be alcohol and drug free. But what we hear from the community is we were throwing these vulnerable people out back on the street when they use. And so there's that threat of accountability uh, versus uh, really trying to help people and completely help people in recovery. And uh, in Vermont, we have really high uh, landlord tenant laws. So we're again beat up from that angle as well. I just wonder if you have any observations as it relates to kind of balancing both of those. So I mentioned earlier, I thought maybe I didn't. I am an alumni of the Healing Place. And I had two relapses or two recurrences while I was there. And they sat down with me and it wasn't any berating or authoritarian kind of stuff. They asked me some questions and I tried as best I could to answer them as honestly as possible. And what I found out later from becoming a facilitator, those nuggets of honesty from just having a conversation and, and them reaching out to me, the presentation that gave them something for them to sink their, sink their teeth into to give me another shot. How often, how often do we do that? You use, you're gone. Sit down with them. Have a conversation with them. You know, my literature talks about sometimes a recurrence or a relapse can have the effect of kicking a man upstairs rather than down or a woman or just a person upstairs rather than down. If they have been wrapped and soaked in the recovery principles and they have begun to stick, and it's like, okay, let's have a conversation about this relapse or recurrence. Can you see how these principles are to have, have just flowered and come true in your life? If we can help them with that light going off, man, let's, okay, if, if at all possible, if they need some medical, if they need to be medically cleared before you can let them back in the house. But let's, let's move away from this punitive one and done or three and done. And, you know, we're, we're just playing whack-a-mole. These are human beings. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Sure. Let's see here. Again, okay, so yeah. The, um, yeah, so yeah, basically, yes, this is part of the structure of the house, but also as a resident, these are the things. And so what I'm trying to do in some small part is that when you have these conversations in your communities about NIMBY, this is a possible way to frame it. I hope that makes sense. Twenty twenty one, the state law committee came out with something that is similar to the Florida statute, where the landlord tenant law does not apply. Also, as a matter of state law, you might want to talk with whomever your local attorney is to determine whether or not uh, there is a provision to take out from the landlord tenant law protection, which I understand is an uphill battle. Uh, but there is at least some law in the state of Michigan that would allow that. Thank you. That's true in New Hampshire as well. Okay. So, When we're talking about recovery and recovery principles and, and an environment in a house, what's more important to follow the letter of the law or the spirit of the law? Right. So if we're, I mean, even with the, um, if we as operators and facilitators are buying, abiding by the spirit, the letter is going to take care of itself. So yeah, someone has a recurrence. Let's see what we can do to keep them in the house instead of putting them out. To bypass a lot of that. And what kind of message was, does that send to the other residents? I'm not saying there would be a, in a situation that would be free of a life experience or 
a consequence. Yeah, there's going to be some, but let's make it a teaching moment. Let's make it a teaching moment. And, how, and, and again, what does that say to the other residents in the home is like, wow, every other place I've ever been, when that happened, they, they put that guy out or that woman out. They put that person out. Man, these, the folks that are facilitating and running this thing, they really do care about us. Again, another environments where recovery is viewed positively, people are welcome instead of indoctrinated, where there is a sense of belonging, hope, connectedness, and purpose. Residents are taught to practice recovery principles in every life, situ life living situation that arises in the home. And that, these are really simple. We practice this with the residents, but we also teach the residents to practice this with one another, to ask versus tell, to make requests versus make demands. Like a, I'd like to think that uh, my experience has simply been with the asking and the requesting that de-escalated a whole lot of stuff. And when the residents were taught to do that with one another, that de-escalated a lot, a whole lot of situations. And it created, a, it created that gap in that environment where honesty and, and real sharing and human communication and connection could take place. Owners and operators of peer staff manage the environment and not the people. Simple example of environment management. Nate, I'm, let's say, uh, do I get... Hold on, I think I got another example further on. Um, Dr. Leanne Cascudis came up with six core principles of successful social model recovery residences. You know, and real quick, physical environment, a non-institutional clinical setting, staff role to interact as peers to encourage and empower residents, the authority base, peer staffs and credibility and trustworthiness come from their recovery experiential knowledge and that we, and as I call this kind of, and along with governance too, as peers, that's where we got to roll our sleeves up and teach. Refer back to the guidelines. Again, can we teach them to wrap, wrap those recovery principles around all those living situations? Um, view of dealing with this SUD. SUDs are viewed as being centered in the shared relationship between the individual and their recovery society. Again, encouraging a human being with a substance use disorder to take full, full responsibility for that substance use disorder. Any other corresponding conditions and full acceptance and empowerment of the recovery pathway. Governance, empower residents ownership through the governance of house guidelines. Uh, so let's see, Nate and I are roommates. And let's say Ron is our resident manager. I come in late for curfew. Curfew is 11 o'clock. Nate goes running around. My roommate came in late last night, Ron. Hopefully, Ron would say something to the effect of, Nate, that's your roommate. That's your brother in that room. Remember all the, the guidelines that we went over, the social model? Whose responsibility is that to bring that to his attention? Is that my responsibility as a house manager? Or is that your responsibility as his brother? It's that simple. There are things that we as human beings, especially early in recovery, man, I'm going to put that responsibility on you. But that's my responsibility that I'm putting on you. And then there's going to be other things that are your responsibility that I want to take on myself. And the social model with a really good experientially person deeply rooted in the recovery principles will separate those things. I was like, no, little brother, that's or little sister, that's my responsibility. Here, hold on, let's come on, let's go on back to the guidelines. Here, what do your recovery principles say about this? And get those responsibilities where they're supposed to be. 
The social model approach to alcohol and drug problems shift the focus to the household and community environment as a way to foster culture of recovery. Residents are invited to draw on the strengths of the household and utilize peer support to shed their addictive lifestyle and reconstruct their self-identity as a person in recovery. Because recovery is a reality that is exemplified by recovering peers and staff, recovery grows out of hope and results in a process of self-redefinition and rebuilding of the life in the community. Central to the social model perspective is maintaining a focus that emphasizes that the quality of the household as a recovery environment rather than focus primarily on an individual resident. Although there are some differences related to the understanding and addressing these issues between our levels, much of what promotes the social model is relevant, is, yeah, <laughs> relevant to all four levels. So, yeah, we'll pop. So I'm sure you guys have all, anyone here not familiar with the NAR levels? We can have a conversation there. Come, I mean, Dave is here. Susan Benz is here. We've got, you know, Nate is here. Scott, Scott is a monster with the NAR levels. Come speak to any of us and we can get you some information and, um, and some assistance. And with that, that's my portion of the presentation, I give you Nate Conklin. Thanks, Tony. So I wanna talk about some best practices when it comes to preparing for and being ready if NIMBY pops up during one of your projects. And it's kind of interesting because I get to work with people across, across the US and how truly every community is different. You know, some people, I, I broach the subject and they say, nah, we got that. We got this lined up. X, Y, and Z is going to go happen if this happens and this happens. And then others, even if there's quote unquote laws in place to protect it, that locality, because of its frontier nature, they said, no, we're not going to be able to get that up and running. And you say, why? And they say, NIMBY, man. And I said, well, isn't there laws in place? They're like, sure, but we got to live here. You know, so it was, it was eye-opening to me that in 2021 and 22, NIMBY is still such an issue. But these best practices can help you prepare. And as I'm going through this, I want to kind of weave in and out of some lessons learned that I experienced through one of my uh, projects in 2020. Okay, some lessons learned through not following these best practices to perfection and, and what ended up happening as a result of that. It was in a very tiny frontier community that was very isolated and NIMBY derailed a project. So prepare early. Um, first and foremost, I want you guys to know that the outcome depends on what you do before NIMBY kicks in. Preparation, okay? Even if you don't think you need it. I didn't think I needed it. The team we had with the sheriff and the law enforcement and the SUD provider and the business owners thought we were good to go until we weren't. So get prepared before the NIMBY kicks in. And be ready to address legitimate concerns. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here. Everybody here is a proponent of recovery housing. That doesn't mean everybody in the community is or has to be or should be. It's a scary thing, right? Change is scary. Uh, the division in communities is, 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 can be scary. Uh, address, address their concerns. Do not demonize the opposition. You know, say, God, they're just cold-blooded and they're always against these things. But I'll never forget, we were in a, we were in a meeting when NIMBY kicked in at the very end of this project. The money was, was allocated. We were ready to go. We had the sheriff. We did everything the right way. And this old rancher just sitting in the back quietly raised his hand and he says, it ain't going to happen. And he goes, you want to know why it's not going to happen? I go, why? He goes, trust. He goes, we don't trust that this is going to happen correctly. You know, so don't, so don't demonize them because uh, you can get more information if you keep an open dialogue with those groups or people or persons that are, that are demonstrating NIMBY. And you'll cope better with it if those lines of communication stay open. Um, also, structure. A lot of people say, man, there was a recovery house here in 2002 and it went wild and, and it really, you know, brought the neighborhood down and crime went up and I'm, I'm not doing that again. You know, if you live in that neighborhood, is that a fair critique? I believe that is. How do you combat that portion of NIMBY? You lay out through preparation, say, I appreciate that. that that's a reality that can happen. Here's what we're going to do to address this. 
We're going to abide by NAR levels of care. We're going to abide by county. We're going to keep lines of communications open with the neighborhood association or the lo local probation department. You know, get those policies and procedures and action items in place before, uh, and you'll be able to communicate better if NIMBY pops, it, pops up. Um, So recruiting allies, uh, this is something that I've realized over the course is that SUD treatment providers and, and us in the recovery house space in general, we tend to operate in silos. And I think rural communities tend to lend themselves into becoming silos as well. And even within professions within that rural community, it's important to break out of those silos. I've been amazed at the more outreach you do to employers, to regional corporations, to job placement programs, to law enforcement, uh, educational entities. Get, your, get, your, get a broad width of people and engage with them. People that you don't think have any business being a part of it usually are experiencing it at this point in our society. And I've been really impressed with the amount of buy-in that you can get. And the broader your coalition, if NIMBY does pop up and you're prepared for it, it's a lot harder to say no to the sheriff that your rural community trusts. And it's a lot harder to say no to the largest employer in town that says, hey, our workforce is suffering due to addiction. We need to get these people healed, healed up and back in the workforce. You know, I, I employ two, 200 people here and, and I'm, I'm for this project. You know, that'll alleviate a lot of concerns if you have a broad coalition. So outreach to people that you wouldn't normally think you would. Do not operate in a silo. And when you're doing your outreaching and engaging with allies, those people that are against it, that will demonstrate NIMBY, those people will identify themselves as well. And that's something to, to take note of when that's happening, right? So, um, start now. So here's, here's the lesson, here's the first lesson learned. We engaged a broad coalition. We had the sheriff in this, in this tiny town. We had the sheriff, the employers, probation, law enforcement, SUD. We had churches. We had everybody volunteering. And we thought we were golden. And we got our funding. We were expecting 18 to 24 month development period. Funding popped up four months into it. Make it or break it. You have 30 days to accept it. This will keep this program up and running for four years with the amount of money you're about to get. Are you ready to do it? And Sure enough, there was an outside coalition that did not like what was happening in another part of the state that decided to come in and put a, put a, put a stop to the project. And as a result of that, that, that project didn't move forward because the NIMBY was so intense. Now, what we should have been doing is when those little negative things popped up during our Zoom meetings or during the town halls or during interacting, we would say, oh, those are, just, those are just naysayers. There's always gonna be a few, don't worry about them, right? We shouldn't have done that. We should have, we should have taken note, we should have engaged with them. We should have talked with them. Were they talking on behalf of a group of folks? You know, I didn't realize that a lot of the naysayers were just, weren't just talking as individuals, they were talking as a bigger part of a bigger group. And so that really damages the ability to, to create substantial capacity of recovery housing in a very small frontier community that was very isolated and could have used it. So um, engaging local leadership, don't forget to engage with the Chamber of Commerce, with the politicians, to engage with the county commissioners. You folks from rural areas, I don't know about you guys, but the county commissioners are very powerful in the decision-making and getting their buy-in by explaining your plan and your policies and procedures and what you're going to do to keep the quality up is of the utmost importance. Uh, city, city councilors as well. Uh, get all those folks involved up front. So organize. So you're formed a steering committee. Things are going good. I want you to know you need to take a step farther than that. Create a NIMBY planning subcommittee. Plan before it happens. And let's say you go through the whole project and you never experience it. Well, guess what? You've created an action plan for the next project that can help out the next organization to be able to deal, deal with it if it does come up. 
So take that step forward and proactively create an official NIMBY subcommittee as part of your steering committee planning sessions. Just pencil that in in the beginning, right? If you're not proactive, you're reactive. When you're reactive, you're on the defense, you're not prepared, and things are not going to go as well as they could. So I really encourage that uh, to be proactive there. Um, and also the community engagement strategy. Uh, part of that is going to be building your processes and procedures and starting to engage with the media. I'll get to that a little bit later on, but you need to have an actual communication and engagement strategy in place, especially if it's not, you know, if you're an individual organization that's coming new into an area to build recovery housing, that needs to be a strategic planning sessions, more than one to get, to get that going. Anticipate, anticipate, anticipate. Uh, if you're not on offense, you are on defense. Uh, and showcase successes. So when you showcase successes, I think it's really important to say if you're having a Zoom town hall or you're having an in-person meeting, a communication session, get some folks in recovery that have benefited from that. You know, a lot of the folks in this room, me, myself, Tony, you know, we are, I'm a result of recovery housing. I kept going to treatment until I went to recovery housing for nine months and I've been sober ever since. That was the missing link for me. You know, I lived in a small town, so I had to drive four hours to get recovery housing. So this is very, very personal. Get some people to do that. Here's another lesson learned. We did that. We thought we had it covered, but you know what we didn't do good enough? We didn't support them and prepare them enough. We said, here, we want you to present. I think it'll be great. Tell them your story. People will love it. Everybody's going to be for it. Go ahead. That's not what happened. And as a result, you know, they, they were very stressed out and upset at the end of it because the NIMBY popped up at the very end. They needed support to prepare for, if this happens, then do this. If people are being disrespectful, then do this. You know, just quit talking and hand the mic back. Don't interact with them if they're being negative. You know, if you're planning to have showcase people in recovery that benefited from services beforehand and are part of the community, make sure that you support them and prepare them. So stress public safety. We can't get mad at people for asking questions, for being concerned. You know, get your local law enforcement on board. Get the sheriff, the chief of police. You know, that they should be one of the first people you go and talk to. Uh, I've been surprised even very, very conservative, very, very rural, very isolated towns. Uh, they've all been like, yes, please. No, but like I said, nobody is unaffected at this point. They said, yes, please, we need it. How can I help? What do you need from me? What can I do? You know, get, get those trusted people, get the business owners and also get probation and parole. You know, they're, they are all for it. And just in my personal experience, because there's a lack of inventory and recovery housing in rural communities. And uh, they will help communicate the accountability portion of your programming to the larger community. Communication and media relations. So this is the biggest lesson learned here from, from my little case study, is that we did not, through no, we weren't planning on not engaging with them. We just started this thing. The opportunity came up, we moved forward. Things were good and we were gonna move forward, but what did we not do? We didn't engage with the media at all. So the media started to find it kind of suspicious and maybe why aren't they communicating with us? You know, it's a small town. Everything goes through the newspaper. Everything goes through Facebook. I've been hearing a lot of Facebook chatter on our local, you know, what's happening in so-and-so, you know, the little town Facebook group. So why aren't they engaging with us? Well, it was just a group of head of probation, you know, a police officer, a, a social worker, and me that were just giving each other high fives, thinking it was going really well. We, we, need to have, we needed to have a media plan. We needed to highlight the gaps in services that exist. We needed to highlight how the community has been effective, affected by this. Even the naysayers knew, they said, we, we know there's an issue. We don't trust that what's happening is on the up and up, but we know there's an issue. 
but we just didn't know about this. We just learned about this. And I think was the biggest hindrance uh, in the end was not communicating enough with the media. So have a media plan. They don't have to be scary. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a, a uh, versus relationship. Have a media strategy lined up from the very beginning. If you're noticing a theme, it's preparation. Even if you think you've prepared enough, prepare more. So have a media communication strategy beforehand. It doesn't have to start off with, hey, we're here to help and we're building recovery housing. Join us and good luck. No, start off with the need. Start off with highlighting or piggybacking off an article that, that talks about the need in the community and the addiction crisis that we have going on and uh, really work from there. And also surveys. Surveys, if you wanna take the temperature of a community, get a survey out on SurveyMonkey and build one and send it out to the to organization level or individual level or put it out on the local online newspaper or Facebook page. Get that survey out there and do it real, real calculated and you'll get some good feedback on kind of taking the temperature of the community. Did you see a hand? Here, let me give you the mic. <laughs> the online folks want to hear it. This is something in, in a county that we're getting ready to implement programming in with law enforcement in our jail. And we were told by the judge in that county, once they form beliefs about something, their heels are dug in. And no matter what you say, they won't back off. Yeah. That Because they're they formed this belief, they've, they've vocalized it, and they're just dug in. So... We're continuing to see that despite our optimism, our research, our facts, like hills are dug in. This is a very, no, and in this county, we have a McDonald's, a dollar store, and a gas station. So it is teeny tiny. Um, and I'm, we're really stuck. So I, what I was going to ask is, we all know the needs. It's my personal account. It's where I live. So my, my children are raised there. I grew up there. Um we all know the needs of this county, but what if they're just 100% unwilling to, they know, they see it, they, they respond to these calls, these overdose calls and stuff. So what is a way to affect change with law enforcement and, and jail staff with ideals like that? And I'm assuming everybody in this room has a general idea of the type of ideals and beliefs I'm talking about. It's, it's the, we're thin in the herd if they die. Well, they so? told us they don't interfere with drug overdoses because we're interfering with natural selection. And we're thin, and we're thin in this the herd. This was said in a meeting with community partners. It was jaw dropping, heartless. It was, it rocked but the room. That's, I mean, that's what we're not what yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> I'm not saying I live there and it breaks my heart because that's where I'm in recovery. It's where I started using and my mission is to kind of heal my community that I had a part in cracking, you know, so um, it's, it sucks. And we have a great community there. Like a lot of our church, we have church engagement more there than any other county we serve. Judges on board, former Jud judges, yeah. lots of people on board in that county, but then the few select people that are in power. We have two huge programs that we can really implement change. And we have law enforcement with one and our jail with the other. And it sucks. So solve that yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get right on that. I, I think, I think it, and we have some slides coming up that kind of deal with that, and it's definitely not going to be the answer you want. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to get to that. And because we run into that in, at some places too, and, and uh, you're not going to win everybody over. And sometimes a draw is the best you can do in raising awareness and playing the long game because the addiction crisis needs to be addressed and, and we're all suffering from it. But you are spot on. There is some people that. Yeah. Mutually beneficial. Just to kind of just what you were saying, one of the best things that you can do is do a community call to action where you engage with the entire, the entire community as a whole. You get all of your faith-based organizations, you get any nonprofits, any local orgs that, um, you know, are impacted by this. And obviously across all sectors, we all deal with people that are, um, you know, dealing with substance abuse disorders. There are, there are our brothers, our sisters, our moms, our dads, they're related to us. So at the end of the day, they affect everyone. They are our family. So sometimes getting, um, you know, kind of getting that going and really showcasing how much overall community support there is, 
really leaves them little room to say, no, nobody's really behind this. Yeah. So you can show that the entire community comes together and unites to kind of address that issue. If I could make a quick observation, one of the things that I've not heard yet this afternoon was you probably need to go talk to a fair housing lawyer, a federal fair housing lawyer. Uh, also, the Department of Justice gets involved in certain occasions. And if you want a real litigious lawyer, go find somebody that only deals in federal court. Uh, and you might want to also consider having a court reporter come to the meetings to, I've done that successfully in Michigan a couple of times, is basically you're going to make sure that they understand this is what the law is, and they've got the duty to legally to comply with that. And if they don't, uh, I know there is a case, uh, you can look it up in the federal uh, reporter, uh, Dalton Township, uh, which is a small township north of Grand Rapids, Michigan, where the DOJ came successfully and said uh, all of the plaintiffs' attorneys' fees were awarded. They got lost profits. And here's the beauty part. They required the entire planning commission of the township to go to an educational seminar on federal fair housing law. <laughs> So, and if I can, I would, I would say I agree with Jeff's words there. I would also suggest that you don't need to be necessarily looking for an attorney within your own state. If you look at the case law, you'll find that there are, two, there are attorneys that specialize in recovery housing. And because the federal fair housing law is so specific and recovery housing is such a really unique area, you might want to look outside of your own state. So public meetings. So rural communities, I don't know about the ones you guys come from, but the town halls are still how kind of things get hashed out. And you can still do that format in Zoom. That, that can help things maintain order. That can help people who can't attend due to other obligations be able to attend. You can also document feedback in the chat rooms or in the chat boxes. Um, so it's easier to maintain and implement uh, rules um, through Zoom. It's another story in public meetings. You know, that was one of the lessons learned. We, we had the rules printed, we put them up, we did the announcements. We said, if X, X happens, then Y happens. Uh, we, we got intimidated in the final public meeting because there was uh, aggressiveness going on and we did not follow through with the rules such as just shutting down taking the mic or asking folks to leave that were being disruptive. Um, but it's harder, to, it's harder to do in the moment, right? We didn't plan enough. Like I said, up until that point, we thought we were kosher. So Zoom is easier to maintain, but also uh, maintain structure. But also in, in the area I was working in, there was people that didn't have internet access. That's still a thing. They says you need to do this because there's about 500 people that live over there that don't have access that need to have their voices heard. He said, okay. <laughs>